The title of this series that we've been doing over the summer is called I Believe in God. Last month it was I Believe in God the Father. This month is I Believe in God the Son. And the key word here is obviously God, but, but the action word is believe. Like I believe. This, it takes some action there. I believe I'm doing something. The object of my faith is God. But I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. Am I saying that more than once? I'm not broken or anything like that. I believe. Okay. How many of you have been struggling with doubt lately? Interesting enough, the title of this message is I Believe in God, the title of the series. And people like crazy have been struggling with doubt probably like never before. Is the enemy up to something? Right? Now, let me just tell you and remind you, we're believers, not doubters. So I want you to declare, I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. Okay? I believe in God, the Son. Now, I'm going to be very vulnerable with you. I'm not in this season right now, but I have been in, in, in a season in the past. Um, I was raised in church. I grew up in church. A lot of you know that. But for years, I lived a defeated lifestyle. And I grew up in church. For years, I would hear people's testimonies and only wishing, only wishing that, man, I wish that was my story. I wish that was my breakthrough. And I would hear of miracles and I would see them and, 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 and I, inside I was like, man, I wish God would show up for me like he showed up for them. And sing songs like the song that we sing here at Tree of Life that, that God is good that he's good, that he's so good, and then we get into the bridge and, you're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. We sing it with everything we have, we're rocking. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down, but deep inside, you're thinking, God's let me down several times. He let me down this week. I'm just going to be honest with you. I love that song, but God's going to let you down. Why? Because you have expectations that he will not meet. And when your expectations are not met, you get let down. Right? That doesn't take anything away from God's goodness. God is still good. Even if your life is bad, God is still good. Right? But the, the truth is that, that I had a hard time singing songs because I'm like, ah, he's an overcomer, but I'm defeated. He's the healer, but I'm sick. He's the way maker, but I'm like, I, I'm stuck. So I'm having a hard time singing this song. And we would sing songs like, like, all I need is you. And I'm like, I need money too. <laughs> all I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. I'm like, I need a career. I need an education. You know, I need money. I need, I need a wife. I was single singing that song. All I need is you to give me a wife. All I need is you, Lord. And I want a wife before you come back for the rapture. I want to make love to my wife that you'll give me someday. Let's be honest. And, and for years, I was very negative, bad attitude. For years, um, I was an unhappy Christian, a weak Christian, a scared Christian. That's an oxymoron. I was a discouraged Christian. I was an ignorant Christian, didn't know the word. For years. You might be here today, and you can probably relate to what I'm saying, and, and maybe you're here today, and you're just like, I'm not a happy Christian. I'm negative most of the time. I complain a whole lot. I'm not really that grateful. Matter of fact, I, could, I barely want to be here today, <laughs> right? So, so, so the issue is this. What God put in my heart for you, and this is the title of this message, because this is what I'm going to talk about. My challenge to you today is for you to rewrite your story. Rewrite your story. Now, right up front, I'm going to tell you, you can't rewrite your past. Only Jesus can. 
You can't rewrite your past, only Jesus can. You can't redeem your past, only he can. And, but, but you have the ability and you have the, the, the privilege uh, God has made a way for you to rewrite your narrative. What you say. The story that you're writing. And, and, and let, me, let me say this. Is, is, have you ever uh, believed a story that wasn't true? About somebody else. And, and I hear this all the time. Oh, Pastor, that person doesn't like me. Oh, you guys had a conversation about it? No. Oh, someone else told you? No. How do you know? I just know. You need to rewrite that story. So the scripture that I want to read today, Jesus, and I'm going to set up and we'll read it here in a moment. Jesus is now coming to the end of his mission on earth. And he is now transferring authority. He's transferring uh, responsibility. He's speaking to his disciples. And they're with him for years now. They're with him for three years. Uh, they've been with him as he performed, when he performed the miracles. They witnessed it. And, and they know that he's powerful. And they know that he is something else, that he is different. And they know that God is with him, but they still, they're not convinced that he is the Messiah. And so he asked them a question, and we'll read this in Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 19. Let's read this together. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is. Now, let me stop right there. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, and he's the Son of God. Why? Because he was born of a virgin by the name of Mary. That's why he's the Son of Man, because her seed was preserved. That she was from a lineage that came all the way back from Adam, but from David, King David. And so she had king's blood in her. And so he's the Son of Man because he was born as a man. Okay? But he's the Son of God because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Now, so, so who do people say that the Son of Man is? There are people that are saying things about Jesus, even right now. Some of you are saying things about what you believe Jesus is like. And let's go to the next verse. Verse 14 says this. And they said, some say that John the Baptist and others, Elijah. People still say that. But still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. You know, Muslims believe in Jesus Christ. They believe he was a great prophet. People believe that Jesus was a great prophet. Even other religions, they believe this is what they still say about him or, or one of the prophets. What are other people saying about Jesus? What have you been saying about Jesus lately? I, he was just a good man. But I'm not sure if he was the son of the living God. And then he says this, okay? He says this. So what are other people saying in the next verse? And he says, okay, so what's the story? What, what are other people saying about him? But then he said to them, how do you say that I am? But who do you say that I am? Now, that's another level. What are they saying? What are you saying? You see it? What do they say? Okay, well, what do you say? But who do you say that I am? What's coming out of your lips? What do you believe? And then we, we go to the next one. Now it's on a deeper level. And Simon and Peter answered, you are the Christ. It's the Messiah. Christ means anointed one. He was anointed as king, as priest, as prophet. Those are the three offices that Jesus had. He's also a teacher and, and he pastor and, and evangelist. He was everything, all the fivefold ministry. That's what he was. And, and so, but, but you are the Christ. This is what Peter said. The son of the living God that came out of his heart. It came out of his mouth. And here's what Jesus said. Now, okay, what do they say? What do you say? Now let's hear what God says. And here's what God said through Jesus Christ as the man. He was the son of man, but also the son of God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, 
Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If you're going to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, I can't reveal that to you. I can say it to you. I can preach it to you. No one else can reveal that to you. God himself, the Father, must reveal that to you. But here's the thing. Jesus is now speaking. So they say, I say, but what does God say? Let's go to, let's go to the next verse. I also say that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, Hades, will not overpower it. Now, God's speaking now. This is powerful. Whose story are we going to believe? Their story, my narrative or God's narrative? Right? And he says, I say that you are Peter. Let's go to the next verse. It says this. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And someone said, Amen. This is powerful. Man, I love this. This is so powerful because. Jesus declares a word over Peter, and he says, I'm going to give you some keys. And, and upon this rock, okay, upon this revelation that, that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, upon this revelation, awesome things are going to happen. Now, Peter goes from that encounter, and, and it doesn't seem like the word is becoming a reality. It doesn't seem like it's happening in his life. If you follow the story, and I'm not going to go really into his story, Peter, but if you follow Peter's life, uh, Peter, he denies Jesus three times. Prior to that, Jesus has to rebuke him because he's influenced by the devil. He even calls him, get thee behind me, Satan. And, and he denies Jesus three times. Uh, he's uh, discouraged. He's depressed. Uh, he's mourning. He's grieving. He goes back to fishing. He goes back to his past. What serving God is not working anymore, so I'm going to go back to doing what I used to do, and so I'm reverting back to an old lifestyle, and so Peter, Peter goes through some steps, and, and, and even though the word was declared over his life, it seemed like he was going backwards. Have you ever felt that way? You get baptized, and all of a sudden, uh, you're struggling more than before. Uh, prior to getting married, things were going great. You were getting along. Now you're married, and you can't stand each other? You say yes to Jesus, and it just seems like all oh, hell, it breaks loose, like the gates of hell are prevailing against you. That's what happened to Peter. Peter went through some hard and difficult times. The Bible gives us some insight regarding the enemy. The Bible tells us there, that there is an adversary, there is a devil, there is a spirit at work against the sons of God. Against God himself, but he can't, he can't compete against God, but he can, he can attack us and, and he can get to us by way of thought, by way of our minds, but we, the way that, that we act and, and all of those things, but really it's the words that we speak. It's the, it, it's the story that we believe. Now, now the devil, the Bible tells us that he is the prince of the air. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it's not on the screen, I'll tell you. The Bible says that he is the prince of the air, that, that he's working, he's working with, with, with sons of disobedience. It also tells us that in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, that, that he is the God of this age. That, that he, is, he's, he has blinded the minds of the people. That's what the Bible says about the devil. And that he is like a lion, walk, like a lion walking around and, and, and just looking for people to devour them. That's what the Bible tells us about the devil. And so he is definitely real. Have you, have you experienced any resistance, any opposition lately? Not all of it is him, but I'm telling you right now, he's working against you. He's working against you. And, and so, so therefore, the issue is, that the enemy does not want you to believe what God has said about you. He does not want you to agree with God's will. He does not want you to believe that you're victorious. He doesn't want you to believe that you have keys. He wants you to believe that there is no way, that you're not enough, and that you'll never make it. That's what he wants for you. 
So, so, so I want you to understand this. Jesus declared, or God declared, uh, that Jesus would come and destroy the works of the enemy. Here's how he declares it. After Adam and Eve, when they sinned, okay, when they fell short of the glory of God, when they messed up, and you, you and I know what that's like. When they disobeyed God, here's what happened. They made an exchange with the enemy. Here's the exchange. God says, you are blessed, uh, you will reign, and you will rule on the earth, and I have given you all authority. He says this in Genesis chapter 1, 27 and 28, and he blesses them in his image and likeness, and he says, be fruitful, be multiply. He says, subdue, uh, govern. He, he gives us this blessing. We receive that blessing through Adam. Adam receives that blessing. He disobeys, and he transfers that blessing. He transfers that authority. He gives the keys to the enemy to rule and reign in the earth. And there's now a reversal of authority. There's a reversal of power that's now given to the enemy. So here's the point. The earth, unfortunately, manifests the will of the enemy more than it manifests the will of God. Because of mankind. So after man fell, here's what God declares. He speaks this, and it's going to happen, and it has happened. But he speaks this in Genesis chapter 3.15. Are we ready to read this? And he says, and I will put enmity, which means opposition there. There's a fight. I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the devil at this point, the serpent. And uh, we know it's a serpent because the Bible interprets itself. And it later tells us that that serpent becomes a dragon. And the serpent of old, the devil, tells us this in the scripture. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed, the devil's seed, because the sons of disobedience are the sons of the devil. He says, and between your seed and her, I didn't capitalize that. New King James Version capitalizes that. Her seed. Women don't have seed. Okay. They don't have seed. She was conceived, Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit, so that's what it's talking about. That seed is Jesus Christ. Now read this with me. He shall bruise your head. He's talking to the devil. He, Jesus, shall bruise your head. That's what happened on the cross. And you shall bruise his heel. Now here's the issue. Now here's the issue. Jesus Christ has bruised the head of the enemy. Do you believe that? Amen? Now, now here's the issue. The enemy will constantly try to bruise your walk, your heel, your ability to live it out. Okay? So I have three points for you, and I want you to understand this. We rewrite our story with spiritual authority. Okay? I want you to repeat that. We rewrite our story with spiritual authority. So the first point I want you to understand is this. Well, I want you to write this down, actually. The first point is understand. What do we understand? We understand authority. The enemy understands authority more than most of us do. He understands rights. He's a prosecutor. He has to know the law. He has to know what he can work against you. He has to know it inside out. The Bible even says that you believe so do the demons, and they tremble with fear. The devil knows the word more than you do. He knows what he can do and what he can't do according to the law. Let me put it to you this way. The, the devil himself is subject to the law. And he knows it. And so when we don't understand our authority, it's a huge big problem. Uh, I was driving safe on the way home from California. It took us 22 hours to get back. We drove straight through. Uh, we stopped more times on the way back because the kids were up more and they needed to use the restroom. And you know how it goes. If you've ever been on a road trip. Okay. Um, and so I drove careful all the way back, got home safe and sound. Uh, there was all kinds of state troopers on the side of the road and everything. And I was really good on the way home. We get to Fort Worth, Texas, Sagadon, And all of a sudden I get pulled over. And I, keep in mind, I didn't sleep much. I slept very little on this trip, so I was not in the best of moods. This cop comes over, and he's the kind of cop that looked like I could body slam. Just saying. He looked like his uniform was too big for him. That kind of cop. Sorry. So he comes and he says, sir, you know why I pulled you over? And I was like, 
I don't know about you're about to tell me, I guess. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like really in a bad mood. And he goes, you were going 51 in a 30 mile per hour zone. Did you know? And he goes, are you in a, is there a reason why you're in a hurry? And I'm thinking, I'm trying to get away from you, fool. You know, I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. And then I'm also thinking, well, he doesn't, he's trained to say that. He didn't care why I was rushing. He didn't care. So, and I started giving them a reason. I'm like, well, actually, I just drove 22 hours to get here, and I'm really tired, and I just didn't even realize that I was speeding. I didn't know that I was speeding until I saw you. And he says, well, let me see your license and insurance. And we didn't even have our insurance, our up-to-date insurance card. So I'm thinking, he's going to take it for that. And so, and, and it looked like the guy wanted some kind of bonus or something. And so he's, you know, stacking up the tickets. I don't know. Just it looked like he was on an assignment because he ambushed me, basically. And so, so I was really upset. Um, I, you could, I was mad because we spent some money on vacation. <laughs> I don't need a ticket. Right after vacation, as soon as I get home, the same day. And so, um, so, so he goes back, and then another cop shows up. I'm like, the last time two cops showed up, I went to jail. Because I had a warrant. I told my wife. I said, dang, the last time another cop showed up, I went to jail because I had a warrant. I said, I, I looked at my wife and said, I hope I don't have any warrants. Because <laughs> the guy was, he was positioned on the side. I could see him as if just in case I want to run. Was he not? I was, I was like, what in the world? So the guy comes back. And then he says, you're going to receive a citation. And he gives me the whole rights and everything that if I don't show up, that I could, uh, they're going to be issue a warrant for my arrest. Here's the point. I wanted to be rude to the guy. I wanted to say, don't you have better things to do? There are criminals out there, child abusers, rapists, and you're worried about a stupid ticket? I seriously wanted to get, just lean into him because I was grumpy. I was tired of t traveling and driving. And I'm thinking, guys, I just, I, I told you I just got back from my vacation. This is how you welcome me back home? <laughs> I wanted to even pull the pastor card out. And I'm a pastor, bro. <laughs> I'm on your side. You're a peacemaker, so am I. I've never felt like seriously picking on the guy. I've never felt like picking on a cop like I did this few weeks ago, like when I got back last Saturday. Not this Saturday, last Saturday. I didn't, I felt like, because he said, do you understand? Like, like I was a kid. Do you understand, sir? He wanted me to say, yes, sir, I understand. I didn't even want to look at him. I didn't even look at him. I, didn't, I just said, yeah, I understand. I had my sunglasses on. I didn't even look at him. I was looking straight. Yeah, I understand. I asked my wife. I didn't even want to look at the guy. Because I, I felt like I wanted to fight him. You know why I didn't? Because he has authority. He's got backup. <laughs> He's got a gun. He's got backup. The whole state is behind him. The judge is going to be behind him. There's no way that I will win ever. No matter what my excuse is, what my attitude is, it doesn't matter. He wins regardless. It doesn't matter. So I knew that. So I'm like, I got th three kids in here and my wife. I don't want to go to jail. So I will keep my mouth shut. Because he has authority. I understand authority. Authority is knowing that you have the right to exercise power. You have been giving, given the right, as a, as a believer, to exercise spiritual power, divine power. You've been given that right. Now, you didn't earn that right. You did nothing to deserve it. Jesus Christ himself, he came, and because there was an exchange that happened in the Garden of Eden, Jesus Christ had to come in another garden called Gethsemane and do another exchange, to exchange and surrender his will so that he can redeem our will. When Jesus Christ was tempted three times by the devil, he was defeating the devil and making an exchange. He was basically saying, what Adam lost, I've come to recover. What Adam lost is now found when Jesus Christ showed up. 
He came to rewrite history with his story. That's what Jesus did. So, so after all that happened, Jesus Christ dies and he, he's, he, he's raised from the grave. In Matthew 28, 18, this is so powerful, it says the following. It says, it says and Jesus came and spoke to them, his disciples. He's now ready to ascend to heaven, saying, all authority, Jesus Christ is speaking, has been given to me. Where? In heaven. And where? On earth. Now, the keys that were given to Peter, they were for heaven and earth. Do you see that? So, so Jesus now, he has all authority. It's been given to him. And now something powerful takes place. He gives it to us. He gives it to us. I want to read because when we use the name of Jesus, have you noticed that we use the name of Jesus every time we pray? My father taught me to rebuke the devil by saying in the name of Jesus. Why? Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? Why is the name of Jesus so effective that even the demons tremble? Why, why, why do we use the name of Jesus every time we do anything? And anything? The Bible says everything you do, Word or deed, do in the name of Jesus. The reason that we do is because it has authority. Now, I want to read something and lean in on this. I'm going to take my time reading this in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 23, because this is the name of Jesus. This is, when you click on the name of Jesus, you get all of this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Jesus Christ does not have a beginning. The Son of God existed before time. He is God, and he has always been. Do you see that? So he existed uh, before anything was created. Let's go to the next verse. It says this. Read this with me. For through him God created everything, because he's the Word, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So through the Word, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth he made the things that we can see and the things we can't see such as read this with me thrones kingdoms rulers and authorities in the unseen world everything was created through him and for him let's keep reading this revelation because the the people in Colossae and and, and he was writing to the people uh this book of Colossians, because they were doubting Jesus Christ, his deity. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. The word of God does Jesus Christ the word. Let's go to the next verse. It says this, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. That's you and I. He is the beginning supreme over all. All who rise from the dead, because Jesus rose from the grave and from death and from the dead, so do we. He was the first that did that. So he is the first in everything as a man. He rose again from the grave. Let's go to the next verse. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in the man Christ. That's why we use the name of Jesus. The next verse. And through him, God reconciled everything, which means bring back to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Do you believe that? This is what we believe. Okay. This includes you. Hmm. Let's get to it. Who were once far from God, far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. That's what separates us from God, sin. Evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, check this out. This is such good news. Yet now he has reconciled, brought you back to himself. He's he's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But there's a condition. Next verse. But you must continue to believe this truth. 
but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. To understand is to stand under. Let me just flip it for you. You stand under the truth long enough, eventually you'll stand on it. You submit to it, and the thing that you submit to exalts you. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you. That's what it means. We humble ourselves under the word of God, and all of a sudden, it lifts us up. Do you see it? She says, don't drift away, because that's happening. Some of you are drifting away. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard. Remember when you heard the good news? You were excited. You were elated. You, you were so ready to share. You didn't want to miss a service. You didn't want to miss a sermon. You were here early. You invited others. Remember when you heard the good news. Don't drift. Don't drift. Don't drift. Don't get lazy with this. Don't be apathetic and lethargic. Don't, don't, don't lose focus. Keep believing. Keep showing. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed on, as God's servant to proclaim it. Understand authority. We understand that Christ has all authority. Every bit of it has been given to him, and the disciples, when they were on earth, uh, Jesus imparts in them authority. And he says, go and, and perish and go and proclaim the gospel and go rebuke demons out of people, heal the sick, raise the dead, and go and do this. And, and I've appointed you and I've given you authority. They go do that and they come back super excited about it. And here's, let's read this in, in Luke chapter 10, 17 through 20. Let's read this quickly. It says this, when the 72 disciples return, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, check this out. Even the demons obey us when we use your name. Wow. Yes, he told them. This is Jesus, man. He has swag. Jesus is so humble, but he's confident. He's the lion and the lamb. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. That roaring lion has no teeth. <laughs> the devil is nothing. I've saw him fall like lightning, like nothing. Just like that. Just as soon as you see lightning, that's how God, that's how fast he was, he was out of the presence of God. I saw it. Jesus was there. You see that? And then he says this. Look, Jesus, confidence, man. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Not some. Not just partial. All. Depression? Yeah. Anxiety? Yeah. Sicknesses, yeah, cancer, yeah, tumors, yeah, everything. That's all the power of the enemy. His power is to destroy. God's power is to give life. Amen? All the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes. Remember what the snakes do? Remember what the serpents? He bruises the heel of Jesus Christ. All he can do is, is, be, is bruise your heel because you stomped on him so hard. You stomp on him so hard that it hurts your heel, not because he bites you or stings you or not because he can inflict venom on you, because you're doing your job, you're stomping on the enemy. That's right. I'm telling you, you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. I'm just not literally told to look for snakes and scorpions and be like, Jesus' name. He's given you a picture because the serpent is the devil. It's demons. It's, it's the demon's messengers, his workers. Those, those, you stomp on the lies. You stomp on everything the enemy uses to come against you. You stomp on it. You do it. Nothing will injure you. Whose report will you believe? The doctor's report? The media's report? Whose report will you believe? Jesus is telling them something. He's telling them, this is what the story, this is how it plays out. Believe it. Believe it. 
So you got to understand that you've been given authority. So now that I have authority, how do I use it? Right? The second thing, the second point that I want to give you is you have to unlock it. Unlock. You've been given keys, remember? Now, regarding the keys of your home, who has them? Do you give the keys of your home to your children? And you, like little kids, and you say, hey, guard these. Hey, you're responsible for the keys of this house. Okay, baby? Okay, daddy. Now, if you, if you lose these keys, we're going to be locked outside of our home. So please, would you please just take care of them? You have the keys. Okay. You wouldn't do that, but many of you do give your kids authority over you. Oh, yeah, yeah, you do. They run your house. They run your attitude. They run your peace. They run your mind. They run you crazy. You don't know what it's like, Pastor. You're not with them all day. You're right. I have no comeback. <laughs> I have no comeback. That's the truth, that you're with them all day, if you are. The point is this. The point is this. Uh, you know, the dog whisperer, Cesar, he's a Hispanic. I just want to point that out. <laughs> um, Cesar, he says that when he, he used to walk before he became famous, he used to just be a dog walker, and he would walk 40 dogs at a time by himself because he needed to make a lot of money. Um, so he would just charge cheap, but he would walk all of them at the same time. Can you imagine? 40 dogs. And he was asked, how do you do this? And he says, well, the key to uh, understanding the animal is to take authority. It's to understand your authority, and you have to be calm, which is a lot of us don't do that. You have to be confident, and you have to come from a place of love and joy. That's what he says. Those are his four pillars. Calm, confident, love, and joy. And he says, when you're calm, your dog, it takes on your calmness. They take on your peace. They also take on your sicknesses. They also take on your stress. And, and so the guy's interviewing, he goes, man, that sounds like people. He goes, exactly. He says, the problem with America is that the children have more authority than the parents do in the home. That's what he said. And then he goes, so what do we do? He says, calm, confident. Come from a place of love and joy, even with your kids. So you wouldn't give the, your keys to the car to your little ones? Here, here's the keys to the car. Keep them safe. Guard them, please. <laughs> you wouldn't give the keys to your house to a thief. You wouldn't give them to a stranger. Do you know that thieves go to cars and see if they're unlocked? Do you know that they even go and check doors to see if they're unlocked? Because they want easy access. How many of us foolishly, spiritually, we leave our doors and windows unlocked and open? We leave our doors and windows of our hearts and minds of our families and we give the enemy the keys. We give him authority and we say, I'm depressed. I'm sick. I'm defeated. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to serve God. I don't want to walk for him anymore. I would rather live apart from him than with him. Can you see how we do that? We transfer and we give the enemy the keys and say, here's the key. You have authority over me. You dictate my feelings, my emotions. You write my story. I'll believe your lies. Here's the keys. It's exactly what Jesus was telling Peter. He says, he goes, hey, this is done. I declare this. I've said it. It is so. Here are the keys. What are you going to do with them? You unlock the blessings and the promises. You appropriate them in your life. So how do you, you unlock the keys? You have to understand that God has already spoken. Do you know that we have a constitution here in the United States? I mean, when I got pulled over, I was even questioning if I was a citizen. Because my wife told me that they were just doing a sweep or something. I was like, my baby, am I, am I a citizen? I, I, got, I, I'm, I was born here, right? I have rights as a citizen. There's a constitution. I have rights that were written down, and because it's written down, and it's sealed, and it's signed, it has authority. You know when I got married? There was a document that was signed, and the state honors what was written down, and there's authority now. Do you see that? You know that the Bible had to be written because God is an author, and he is the author and the finisher of our faith, and so because he's author, he has authority. 
and his word has authority, and words have authority. They're his DNA, and when we write it down, when it's written down, and, and I even challenge you to do this, but when you write a word down that God has spoken to you, even his very own word, the scriptures, and you personalize it, there is another level of, of authority that happens, that takes place. When you write down your goals, when you write down your desire, it's a level of authority that you are establishing in the earth, saying it is written. That's why Jesus was able to defeat the enemy by saying it is written, not just it said, it is written. And because it's written, I will say it. It is written, get thee behind me, Satan. It is written, you shall worship only God and him alone. It is written that, it is written that God will supply all my, all my needs. The bread is not enough for me. I need the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is written. What is written? What's the story that you're believing right now? It's written. How are you defeating the enemy? Through the word. Do you know the word? That's how you unlock blessings in your life. You got to know the word. So if you're sick, what are the scriptures on healing? Are you reading them? Are you using your keys? You're depressed. What are the scriptures regarding peace of mind? What are the scriptures regarding, you know, how do you overcome anxiety? What does God say? What has he already said that's written? You unlock it. Well, I've done that. You keep doing it. The Bible says keep knocking. Keep asking. Right? Right? It says to keep praying. You keep unlocking because you've been given authority. You have keys that God has given you. Re Revelation chapter 1, 18. This is beautiful. Let's read this. This is Jesus saying this. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. That should give you so much assurance knowing that I'm telling you, God has the keys. And you have the keys to the kingdom of God. So maybe some of the issues that we have, we've allowed it. We've allowed it. Right? Whatever you allow, heaven's like, the invisible world's like, you've allowed it. Whatever you disallow, the, the invisible world, heaven says, we're not going to let that happen. Because it, that person has the keys. God, there are things that God will not do for you. Are we still here? There are things that God will not do for you. Now, he's done everything for you. He's already, the, the Bible says it is finished. Ephesians chapter 1, 3, read this with me because this is, this is powerful. And I am, it says this, all praise to God. Read this with me. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some spiritual blessing. Can y'all read that with me? Who has blessed us with? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Now, here's the question. Every spiritual blessing he's blessed us with, why have we not received it? Because we haven't unlocked it. How do we unlock it? With the word of God, by what we believe, by what we say. How do we unlock it with prayer, continuous prayer, fervent prayer? How do we unlock it? By faith. Faith is a vehicle by which the promises are delivered. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? We don't have faith in faith. We have faith in God. The object of our faith is God. The object of our faith is not Santa Claus. Sorry, I ruined it for you. The object of our faith is not the tooth fairy. The object of our faith is not the lottery. The object of my faith is even is not myself. I believe in yourself. Have faith in yourself. That's not the object of my faith. The Bible says have faith in, in God, and if you have faith in God, you can speak to that mountain and command it to be removed from your life. It's holding you back. It's blocking vision. It's deterring you. It's in your way. It's making your life difficult, and it will not move until you have faith in God. Do you see it? That's how you unlock the blessings of your life. What you do is you tap into what God has already said. You have faith in him. You declare what he has said, and you continue to do this, and you know that it's possible, and it's going to happen because God said it. It is written. Amen? Now, the other day, let me share this with you, okay? And I need to see the time because 0000, zero, zero, zero means eternity to me. And so, thank you, 1214. Um, so, so let, let, I, I got to move. I got to move. I got to move. All right, the next scripture, I'm going to explain it to you because um, you're arguing with the wrong person. Have you had an argument lately with someone that you love? Have, have you fought with your loved one lately? 
Uh, have you argued with your boss or, you know, just like I was going to argue with a police officer, but I know better. I wouldn't have been, I would not be here right now preaching if I would have body slammed <laughs> the servant of God. Um, so, so, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5 says this. We are humans, but we don't wage war as humans do. Uh, we don't cuss people out. We don't body slam strangers. We don't have road rage. We don't. We're humans, but we don't, we're not UFC fighters. <laughs> we're just not. We use God's mighty weapons. Not worldly weapons. Now, I know you got guns. I know you got guns. But Jesus Christ didn't have not one weapon. And he defeated the enemy. He didn't have not one tool. And yet he overcame the world. He says, not worldly weapons. Watch this. To knock down, that's what we sang about it earlier, the strongholds of human reasoning. And to destroy, look at this, false arguments. You got, there's false arguments. There's human reasoning. Attack it in your mind. I, can, I know God spoke to me. On vacation, I know. I could not rest while I was resting because I knew that you were wrestling with doubt. I knew that you were. And so, so what do we do? We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. Wow. We capture, check this out. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Mind, you will obey. Body, you will be healed. Right? My family will be united. My marriage will be restored. As a matter of fact, it is restored. We will be in alignment with what God has said. We will seek first the kingdom of God. We will use our keys to unlock the blessings in our lives. Was that the last verse? That was verse five? Okay. Now, this is an example. I'm resting. I'm going to the finish line. I'm almost there. I'm about to land this plane. My wife and I, um, man, we love each other tremendously, right? But we argue sometimes. And the other day, um, my daughter needed the brush upstairs. And we have stairs. And if you have stairs, it gets tiring. It's tiresome to go up and down for little things. So we've gotten in the habit of throwing stuff up there. You, have you done that before? So Phoebe needs the brush, and my wife's like, all right, here you go. And she had, like, just laser accuracy. And it's Phoebe right on her forehead. Boom. And I just hear, you know, like really loud. I hear, you know, and then. You know how it takes a moment or so for the cry to come? Because it takes the brain, it's like, ow, register, it hurts. Ow, 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 ow. Ah! So she's crying, and I'm sitting there thinking about what God is saying, and I see that, and my wife's like, oh, I'm so sorry. She runs up, and I just get into, like, accuser mode. I get into your bad mom mode. I get into, you should have not have thrown that. I've thrown several of them, by the way. You should have not have thrown the comb. You are being lazy. She goes, oh, you're calling me fat? <laughs> you're, is that what you're doing? All right, and we were going to go to lunch. I'm not going to lunch with you. You go by yourself. She goes, she slams the door. Sorry, baby, I'm putting you out there. But she slams, she, she, whatever. And I'm thinking, I didn't call you fat. I said you were being lazy. I've been lazy too. I was trying to like make up for it and fix it because no, you know, you're not supposed to go there. And so she's like, she's mad. I'm talking about from zero to 100. Bam. And I'm like, oh, snap. I got to fix this. So I'm just like, and I'm mad too at the same time because I'm Phoebe's still crying. And, I, and I'm like, you, but you were being lazy. You need exercise. Go upstairs. Stairs. That's what they're for. And I'm like, it, nothing was helping. It was getting worse. It was getting worse. And uh, it could have been a really bad moment that would have extended the whole weekend type thing. So this is what I did. I took authority. I really did. 
I said, no, that's dumb. I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go eat by myself. I'm not going to let pride get to me. I'll go eat by myself. I'll go to Texas Day Brazil without you, you know? <laughs> go somewhere really expensive just to throw it in her face. Um, and so I said, gosh, i got to humble myself. And I went in the room and I said, look, I was wrong for yelling at you. I didn't give you any grace. It was an accident. And I made it sound like you meant to do it, like you were actually aiming to her, to her forehead. <laughs> got you that's not what she was doing um and so I apologize and I and she goes I'm still not going with you You go by yourself I said look you're going with me we're gonna go together I'm sorry I'm not gonna leave without you and we're gonna make this right a lot of people are struggling in church right now to get along there's a lot of pride there's a lot of issues people are at the brink of divorce they want to separate there are people that are separated and I will not allow us to be separated we're going together yeah. he goes okay <laughs> we went and had lunch it was over it was done such a practical and simple, simple example. You're arguing with the wrong person. My argument's not with her. I know, what, well, I know what's happening. The enemy is trying to get us over, <laughs> over an accident. <laughs> it's so silly. I know what the enemy's trying to do. I'm wondering how many of you guys are arguing with the wrong person. And, and I'll, you shouldn't even argue with the enemy. You should just say, you're wrong. It is written. It is written. It is written. Jesus said a few words, and that's it. He didn't sit there and reason with the enemy. He said, no, that's what the word says. That's what it says. That's what I stand on. He overcame by the word, by faith. Amen? There was a satirian that uh, needed his servant to be healed because he was really sick. He sees Jesus. He says, my servant is sick. He's about to die but you can heal him. And Jesus said, should I go to your house? And the centurion, the soldier, the captain of an army, he said, no, 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 I'm not worthy. I don't deserve for you to come to my home. Um, no, 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 no. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus is like, what? He goes, I'm a man. This is what the soldier said. I'm a man under authority. And there are people under my authority. And when I say go, they go. And when I say stop, they stop. And people obey what I say because they're under my authority. And I know that you're a man under a God's authority, under the Father's authority. So if you just say it, it will happen. Jesus looked to everyone else. He says, I have not found greater faith in all Israel than the faith this man has right now. And then Jesus says, according to your faith, it is done. And the man was healed. It was a word that was sent and unlock the blessings on this man's life because he believed and he understood authority. The last point is this. You got to be undercover. Unless you're under authority, you will not have authority. You know how many people leave Tree of Life and I, they never say bye? They just, they're not under authority. And before you know it, I'm just like, what happened? I don't know. They're somewhere else. They just never say bye. They just like, I'm just going to go to another restaurant to eat. Tired of the food here, whatever. I'm offended. They just leave. They're never on the authority. The people that come to me and say, Pastor, I want your blessing. God is transitioning us. Here's what's happening. And uh, pray about it with us. If it's not God, we won't go. We trust you. And when someone says, Pastor, I'm submitted under your authority, that's a tremendous weight upon me, but I need to hear that. Because then it makes me go to God and say, I can't just say anything. I, these people, they're trusting me. I'm a shepherd. I'm a leader. I'm, gonna, I'm their guide, um, spiritual guide. I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor. And, but there's so many people that are not undercover. They're not under authority. And so the challenge is this. We're under God's authority first and foremost, and then we're under our husband's authority. If you're, if you're a wife, you're under his authority. There's a lot of women that are not submitted to the authority of their husbands. When you're sick, he's the first one who should pray for you. When you're off, you submit to the authority of your husband, and you're undercover, and you say, you have the most authority in my life, baby. 
could you speak a word of blessing over me? Babe, I'm looking for a job and I need one. And so I'm submitting to your authority. Can you declare a word of blessing that op- the doors will open for me? Would you please, because I know you have the most authority. There are people that buy new houses and they think that I have more authority than they do over their house. And that's wrong. I don't. I have authority here in this house because I am the spiritual father here. And God is the one who has the most authority here. But in your house, you're the priest of your home. Men, you have the most authority in your home. So when you declare something, it's more powerful than when I declare it. And I try to tell people that, but we still want you to come bless it. (laughs) I'm not blessed, but I'm just telling to tell you that if the devil shows up in your house, don't call me. You tell the devil to get out. You have more authority. Because I have the most authority, I can preach as long as I want to. (laughs) I'm just joking. It seems that way, and it's true. Um, (laughs) um, But here's the issue. Men, your wife has a hard time submitting to your authority because you have a hard time submitting to God's. She doesn't trust you. She doesn't trust that you'll pray. She doesn't trust that you'll seek God. She doesn't trust that you'll hear from him. She doesn't trust that you are going to the throne room. So what's your challenge? You got keys, brother. What are you doing with them? You have keys. Adam, where are you? He didn't say Eve, where are you? He said, Adam, where are you? You have the keys. Who'd you give them to? I put you in charge. Men, he's giving you keys. Your kids are to submit to your authority. If you don't teach them authority, the the police will. If you don't teach them authority, the world will. And they're ruthless. They're not gentle. And they're not kind. They will force them to submit. God is not like that. So, Psalms 91, 1 through 4. Those who live in the shelter of the most high will find rest in the shelter in the shadow you see you're submitted you're so close to god that your his shadow covers you of the almighty verse two this i will declare this i will say this is my story This report will I believe. David was threatened with his life by King Saul. People were trying to kill him. And he says, this will I declare about the Lord. I will rewrite my story with God's story. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. All hell is coming against me, but the gates of hell will not prevail. I have keys. I have keys. Verse 4. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly Diseases, this is three. Hmm. You got to receive this word, write it down, declare it over your life. He will cover you with his feathers and he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. It's so clear. We need his promises. At the forefront of our minds, there are armor and protection. Those are the keys that have been given to us. This week, we will use them. Today, we will use them. We will forgive because we've been forgiven. That's a key. We receive mercy. We extend it. That's a key. We will thirst and hunger for righteousness and be filled. That's a key. 
Every word that's written is a key. If I believe it, I receive it. I keep knocking. I keep asking. I keep believing. I keep show up. Those are keys. I understand authority. I submit to it. I, I understand that I have keys. We are a people of God who understand that we submit to his leadership and everything changes. Watch. Watch. Breakthrough's coming. Watch. Watch. Look and see. Speak to the mountain. It's going to be different for you. Enough is enough. In Jesus' name.